Uh, well, your other lecturers have uh, happy, upbeat subjects like music and uh, dueling. <laughs> and I'm stuck with economics, which is a notoriously dreary subject. And it's even more of a downer when we consider how far the U.S. is today from the southern Jeffersonian political economy, which was once a very powerful tradition. Economics as practiced today is uh, utilitarian and materialistic, concerned with maximizing profit on Wall Street, with describing the actions of man as an economic being, and explaining the uh, results of supposed economic laws. <clears throat> Our uh, southern forebears did not practice economics. They practiced political economy, which is concerned with human well-being. As Dr. Cully reminded me last night in the deck seminar, um, economics actually begins in classical times as the, the uh, study of the welfare of the household, the family. And uh, this, is, this is largely uh, the place in which um, Southerners in the old days uh, began to study the question of man and economics. But they did not assume that we are all um, entirely economic beings. And they did not believe that economic conditions um, were necessarily uh, determined by abstract laws, but were quite often the result of human actions and human decisions. Some of them uh, the product of corrupt politics. Unlike Marxists and the kinds of capitalists that they decried, they did not believe that material conditions control the thoughts of men. Rather, they believed that the human mind created material conditions. Uh, they did not believe that maximum wealth was necessarily the goal of work. There were such things to be considered as comfortable prosperity, widespread, and such things as stewardship, rather than maximum exploitation of God's bountiful nature. Man must eat, but he does not live by bread alone. Economics um, being the product of human actions and decisions, it was part of the moral realm and not merely technical knowledge. Or to uh, put it more plainly, uh, the Yankees were interested in profit and the Southerners were interested in honor and maintaining a republic. Most of all, <clears throat> Jeffersonian political economy insisted that the health of society was not re represented by maximum or great wealth, but by the widespread ownership of real property. Without widespread ownership of real property, which made the great mass of people independent citizens, there could be no healthy society. And there could certainly be no free society. <clears throat> Uh, this is a real uh, and long-lasting tradition of thought. Uh, much of the American Revolution was, was inspired by this kind of thinking. Uh, it was very fundamental in the uh, settlement and development of the southern colonies before the Revolution. There's a reason why an English poet uh, wrote about Virginia as the earthly paradise because Virginia was a place where you could go and become independent for those who never had any such a chance at home. 
Um. Uh, the ideal of the uh, independent citizen is very basic. It's basic, to, as we've already heard the suggestion, basic to Thomas Jefferson's uh, opposition to the uh, agenda of Alexander Hamilton. And the conflict of Hamilton and Jefferson was the first great American political conflict. And we can find this tradition fully explicated in the writings of John Taylor of Caroline, which I recommend, and in the speeches of John C. Calhoun, and uh, many other Southern statesmen. And uh, I think our early, <clears throat> earlier election lecture suggested how it uh, was reflected in the Confederate Constitution, this way of uh, thinking. Uh, and as Dr. Livingston said, the Hamiltonian, I call it the Lincolnian, uh, agenda did not triumph in the antebellum era that made some progress. But uh, with the War of Southern Independence, Lincoln and his party, in the absence of the South from Congress, were able to install a very uh, advanced form of the Hamiltonian program. And that <clears throat> dominates the American economy and political economy up to this moment that we are sitting right here. Uh, and I suggest to you that at, uh, by that Republican triumph, America became devoted to capitalism. And by capitalism, uh, most often is meant not free enterprise, but private profit subsidized by government, crony capitalism. Mm. A large part of uh, what we speak of as American capitalism is crony capitalism. That tradition runs through. Uh, even after Lincoln, the uh, Southern Jefferson and conception of the Good Society did not completely disappear. Uh, and we find Southern Democrats, uh, even after that, uh, uh, constituting often a remnant of the Jeffersonian tradition in an opposition to big business. The Clayton Antitrust Act of 1914, which was an attempt to, to uh, uh, control uh, consolidation uh, of, of uh, the economy, the Clayton Antitrust Act bears the name of Henry uh, D. Clayton of Alabama, who it was the son of the Confederate general of the same name. The South is still trying uh, to do what it can, <clears throat> can to correct the evil system that had defeated it in the war. <clears throat> and the Glass-Steagall Act of 1932, uh, which carries the names of Senator Carter Glass of Virginia and Representative Henry Steagall of Alabama. Uh, uh, the repeal of this law by the Reagan administration, according to many experts, was responsible for the savings and loan crisis that occurred a few years back. Uh, the crony capitalism was able to repeal this uh, one constructive measure, the uh, New Deal. And I remind you that when we had the savings and loan crisis, nobody could think of anything, either party, and nobody in Congress hardly, could think of any solution to this except bailing out the misbehaving bankers and 
ochres who had caused this situation to begin with. Nothing else, you know, nobody can suggest anything else. We've got to bail these people out uh, so they can continue to enjoy their wealth and operate. Uh, the, uh, the bankers were judged to be too big to fail and too big to jail. Uh, in our Hamiltonian world, nobody could think of anything else. But getting the taxpayers to bail out the um, capitalists. You can bet that our um, Southern Jeffersonian forebears would not have allowed such a thing to happen. Nor many of the other uh, slick deals that have been accomplished, like the recent trade bill, which apparently was passed by both parties without anybody reading it, without the people having it any insight into it. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's a little bit of life in the uh, left of the Jeffersonian political economy, even as yet. Uh, as I said, economics is a dreary, dreary subject. It's also a complicated subject. And I've been studying it for years, trying to study political economy and the history of economics. And I have concluded that most of the people who talk and write about this don't know what they're talking about. Uh, particularly economic historians who tend to uh, discuss economics in terms of political polemics. You know, the Democrats said this in the, about the National Bank, and the Republicans said this. Well, you know, politicians and uh, special interests don't tell the truth. They tell what's to their advantage. They don't tell you what's really going on in the economy. Uh, you have to look a little deeper, and there are an immense number of variables at work in an economy, a huge national economy like ours. So I don't think anybody really understands it, but I'm, what I'm discussing here is an ideal, the two conflicting ideals of Hamilton and Jefferson that have characterized American history uh, and uh, American uh, attitudes almost from the beginning. Jeffersonian political economy was the ideal implicit in, in I'll take my stand. And a few years after I'll take my stand, some of the same writers, the 12 Southerners, and were joined by some Northern and uh, British writers <laughs> in a work called Who, Who Owns America? A New Declaration of Independence, which uh, perhaps is the last formal defense of the humane economy, uh, political economy of Jeffersonianism. The Great this was 1936. The Great Depression uh, had generated a lot of discussion about the uh, fundamental reform needed in the American regime. The communists and socialists were certain they had the answer, government control of property, of the means of production. The progressives thought that capitalism could be saved, but it needed to be managed by expert planners uh, like themselves. And this is basically the approach of the uh, new, new Deal. Who Owns America took a different stand from anybody else uh, at the time. Who Owns America? Well, might you ask. Uh, according to the, these writers, both the capitalists and the socialists were asking the wrong questions. Both took for granted that uh, the gigantic concentration uh, of power over the economy and a few great corporations and a few great banks 
uh, was a given. And they only argued over the details of management. There was little difference between them. Most, uh, you know, both were preserving a system in which the mass of the people were wage owners at the mercy of the owners of property. And this was the wrong kind of society. The U.S. had begun as and had long continued to be a society of widespread property ownership of independent citizens. And the writers who owns America say free enterprise is a good thing. Private property is a good thing. We're all for these things. We reject socialism. But we also question the existing domination of America by corporate capitalism. Uh, John Taylor Caroline had pointed out uh, back in his great exposition of Jeffersonian political economy uh, an inquiry into the principles and policy of the government of the United States. Taylor had pointed out a rich country is not the same thing as a happy people. And a rich government is certainly not the same thing as a prosperous people. If we ask today who owns America, here's what we get. <clears throat> the richest 3% of families own 54% of the national wealth. The richest 10% of families own 75% of the national wealth. Most of the rest of us don't own anything except a mortgage. Uh, we are at the mercy of large institutions. We are not the independent citizens that Jeffersonian said were necessary for a free society and a healthy society. <clears throat> Uh, these inequalities in wealth are greater now than they were in 1936 when they commented on them, and they have been increasing steadily for the last 40 years. Or all, actually, almost 50 years. Uh, according to Who Owns America, huge corporations, in effect, own the U.S., and they own the politicians, and they own the media. So we ask, what, what is a corporation? <clears throat> the founding generation considered corporations to be the same thing as a legal monopoly, which is generally not a good thing. And in the Philadelphia Convention, it was voted down giving Congress the power to, to grant charters of incorporation. It was actually voted down. Uh, this, however, did not uh, prevent Alexander Hamilton from insisting on the chartering of a national bank as soon as the government got underway because he said it's necessary and proper. <laughs> for the government's functions. Uh, and <clears throat> John Taylor uh, comments that this is the first of countless instances where mere verbiage, uh, were, wording was employed to divert uh, the plain intent of the Constitution. <clears throat> a corporation is a legal person Except that unlike a person, it is immortal, and it cannot feel pain or guilt. The 14th Amendment was supposed to be uh, about giving rights to the newly freed uh, slaves. Uh, shortly after it passed, uh, its whole passage was illegal. 
Shortly after it passed, the U.S. Supreme Court declared that corporations were persons in the law. Like persons, they have rights that may not be interfered with. And the Supreme Court vetoed numerous efforts by states to uh, control, regulate corporations in various ways. And under the cover of the uh, Supreme Court, corporations proliferated. They're like Kudzu and did pretty much whatever they wanted to do in terms of uh, uh, treatment of the workers and the environment uh, and marketing practices. Uh, it has been argued that the unscrupulous Republican uh, pushers of the 14th Amendment actually planned for this when they were pushing about how we need the rights of the freedmen. They actually uh, knew uh, what they're doing. According to Hillens America, the capital, capitalists yell about threats, to the inter, about threats to free enterprise and the evil influence of uh, legislation with the law of supply and demand. The trouble is, they said, Big business does not practice free enterprise. It is too powerful to tolerate competition. There's a lot of small free enterprise in America, a lot of good entrepreneurship, but not in, not in big business, which controls rather than participates in the market. Uh, the authors point out that in the Depression, the prices of farm products fell by over 30%. The prices of automobiles and steel did not fall at all. Now, presumably, uh, if the law of supply and demand is working, a, a, a lessening of demand will bring a fall in prices. And it happened in some parts of the economy. But uh, guess what? It didn't happen uh, in the uh, large uh, industrial centralized part of the economy. Prices didn't come down at all. Uh, something was interfering with the free market. The large corporations, rather than reducing prices, reduced wages, fired workers, cut production, uh, rather than lowering prices, which would be the natural operation of supply and demand. And they could do this because their foreign competition was excluded by tariffs. And uh, they were powerful enough to stifle any potential domestic competition. Put it out of business before it got started. And the, uh, the, the solution offered by the New Deal was simply to flood the economy with cheap money so as to increase demand. And this presumably will help unemployment, but it also will keep up the products of uh, the corporations by increasing demand. So much for free enterprise. And they suggested further, these corporations don't exist because it's not because of the operation of economic law it's consented that, uh, contended that centralization is the natural course of events in economics. So centralization, central control, consolidation is more efficient. So it, you know, it uh, uh, is a result of economic law. Uh, and who uh, owns America suggests no, it ain't so. Uh, the current we have, uh, you know, giant corporations don't exist because they are necessarily more efficient. And in fact, our industry is not uh, controlled at all by managers or by entrepreneurs. <laughs> it is controlled by bankers. 
wealth had come to consist of entries on bankers' books. Now, uh, a very irresponsible type of property. Uh, now it's you know now it's a flash on the computer screen. Uh, dots on the computer, and and uh, this is a highly uh, manipulable form of property that is a very long way from uh, what the founding fathers conceived of as ownership. Um, you, um, you remember that all the business about derivatives, which is gambling on Gambling on abstractions, abstractions, which is, you know, cause a lot of havoc in the economy. Um, the, um, you know, what do you own when you own corporate stock? You own a uh, piece of paper, presumably, that which gives you uh, some ownership of a corporation. You might get dividends if dividends are paid. You could sell your stock. You might make more than you paid more or less than you paid more. The great advantage is you're not really responsible for the debts of the corporation, except to a very small extent. In fact, everybody who participates in this corporation is not really responsible for the debt. And the owner of stock uh, has no uh, managerial responsibility uh, and certainly no moral responsibility for what the corporation does. And this, uh, you know, this, it doesn't matter whether it's a group of business executives, a group of um, progressive planners or a group of Communist Party officials. A few people control uh, um, what is going on, and it is in their interest to have it, the control as consolidated and centralized as possible. Uh, John D. Rockefeller never did a day's productive work in his life. But he controlled Standard Oil, which controlled a large part of the market in the U.S. Uh, and it was not the socialists who hated Rockefeller. In fact, his descendants have created foundations which promote uh, socialism. It's not the socialists that, that uh, hated him because hey, he's centralizing the economy. So it'll be much easier for us to take over. And uh, Rockefeller said what he was doing was socially beneficial because he was centralizing the economy and making it uh, the industry and making it more um, efficient. And he uh, exhibited his uh, Yankee public spirit by handing out dimes to, to uh, Sunday school children. Uh, it was the entrepreneurs who hated Rockefeller the people who went out and risked their money and used their smarts to get the oil out of the ground. And uh, when they had done so, they found that Rockefeller Capital had bribed state legislators, uh, had rigged railroad rates, had uh, gotten control of refineries, <clears throat> had acquired and suppressed patents that would have helped a small producer. And uh, they had no way to, to sell their product except to deal with Rockefeller, which usually meant that, he, that they had to turn up, turn up or control to him. And this was the great official consolidation that was going on. Uh, 
Uh, and I guarantee you that today, if Laura, Lawrence Rockefeller, the president of Chase Manhattan Bank, calls up the president of the United States, the president will take the call as soon as he can. Uh, unlike uh, you or I, or even a senator. Um, it's real power when, uh, when you're power, you're able to make your power not even mentioned. I mean, the, you know, the banks have this power that is so vast that it's never mentioned. And that's real power. You know? And if anybody does mention it, they're a conspira you know, conspiracy theorist, a lunatic. But uh, the authors of America, as did those who all take my stand, ask what is so great about the concentration of industry in a few gigantic firms? Is a huge factory necessarily more efficient than a lot of small factories spread through the countryside? No, not necessarily. In fact, most uh, uh, more recent knowledge suggests that it's uh, the opposite. But uh, the huge factory is certainly less humane and certainly harder on the uh, workers in every respect. We have these giant uh, concentrations because they are uh, what the bankers want. And the bankers uh, get what they want. And if they want to uh, close the plan and ship the process overseas uh, or import cheap workers uh, from abroad, then they can do so. And it's, you know, there's the, uh, there is no moral responsibility, no social responsibility. And this lack of responsibility is defended as somehow the product of economic law. And according to Hillens and we don't want to do away with private property or a free, free uh, market. Um, what we want to see is property spread around, increase uh, the number of people who have uh, enough property to make an independent living. That's what, that is what we should be thinking about and aiming our policy towards, not just in controlling the, co the corporations, although that's, or who will manage the corporations, although that's important too. And particularly, of course, they wanted to see the South uh, regain control of its own uh, economic fate because without any question, everybody understood at the time that the uh, development of the South was, had been inhibited by federal legislation and, and uh, trade practices. The, uh, the goal of the uh, Lincolnian America was to keep the South as a colonial possession, a, a land of raw materials and cheap labor for the benefit of the North. And it uh, pretty much remained that way, certainly after World War II, and that is true to a considerable extent even today. Uh, but of course, who owns America? <clears throat> It was too humane, too humane, humane, too lacking in money and to buy politicians and media, which is the way things are done in the Hamiltonian Lincoln in America, and too unappealing to the vast herds of uh, petty intellectuals who dominate discussion in the United States. It was a lost alternative. Uh, presented at the time. Um, I'd like to say a little about the Hamiltonian, later the Lincolnian program. Although you, I can't really get into it, but they, uh, 
Hamilton's program consisted uh, primarily the tariff, the national bank, and the public debt. Dr. Livingston has commented on some of this. The Constitution gives the, the Congress the power to tax imported goods, a tariff, a customs duty. And the idea was that, well, the new government needs some money to support it. <clears throat> Although it's not going to do very much, it needs some money to support it. And with the tariff, you don't have to tax the people or the states directly, and it basically, uh, the tax mainly falls on people who can afford to import luxuries. So let's get the Congress the power to, to tax imported goods. Seemed like a good idea at the time. George Mason of Virginia uh, was a major player in writing the Constitution. He had a major role in shaping it. He refused to sign it, and he went back home to Virginia and did everything he could to prevent the ratification of the Constitution. And he said, nah, this terror power is a very bad idea. Very bad idea. The Yankees will use it to loot the South. And that is exactly what happened. Although not right away. Hamilton didn't get his tariff right away. But for the 40 years before mm, the war between the states, the tariff was rendered as protective. It wasn't to raise revenue. It was to keep people from importing uh, for British goods and foreign goods because the tax the tariff made the cost of them too high, and you had to buy uh, overpriced goods from the factories of New England instead, uh, which, you know, was good for them and bad uh, for the South. Five sixths of federal revenues collected at southern ports, mostly spent in the North. This was for the 40 years prior to the war. Mm. Uh, and even though the South provided the overwhelming quantity of U.S. exports, uh, which, without which uh, foreign trade would hardly have been possible. <laughs> in fact, but in fact, the South through this period had faced declining prosperity and paid most of the taxes. Uh, and the brilliant historians of today tell us that the tariff wasn't important in Southern secession. It was all about slavery. The tariff is unimportant because to them, it only oppressed Southerners and Southerners don't count. So it couldn't possibly be important in a situation where Northerners are supposedly morally uh, involved about slavery. <clears throat> oh, well, to, you know, all you need to do is understand what happened between just in the first few months of 1861 between Lincoln's election and Fort Sumter. And if you don't understand what happened there, you will never understand what the Civil War was about. At first, the North said, reacted fairly calmly. They said, uh, uh, people pointed to the Declaration of Independence, the consent of the governed. Let the erring sisters go in peace. Even the abolitionists said, you know, we're free. Uh, the North is now free of this contamination of the South. It's a good thing. Uh, and then the Congress passed a uh, tariff of 40 to 50 percent on most imported goods. The Confederate Congress passed a tariff of 5 percent on imported goods and Declared that the U.S. citizens had free were in, had free navigation in the Mississippi River and free use of the Port of New Orleans. Uh, influential Northerners understood at once what this would mean. They would lose their captive source of revenue and their captive market in the South. <coughs> their profits would nose nose down. They might even have to pay taxes themselves. Uh, which they were not inclined to do. Not only would they lose the South, but it was obvious most of the rest of the country in Mississippi Valley would trade uh, uh, through the free trade South rather than through the uh, 
northeastern U.S. In public speeches and private letters and newspaper editorials and petitions to Congress, and in every possible way, influential northerners known that it be known that war was preferable to allowing the South to escape. If I had the time, I could fill 10 books, 10 volumes with these statements like this by northerners uh, at the war. I, you know, we have to. We can't let them go because it will ruin our economy. Uh, an interesting satellite, which is never mentioned. While they were freeing the slaves, the Republicans passed what they called a contract labor law. And this allowed corporations to collect gangs of workers in Europe, Central and Eastern Europe and Ireland. Uh, these workers would have their, page, their passage overpaid in exchange for going to work for a certain, certain number of years uh, in the company's uh, industry. Obviously, you know, these workers are pretty, pretty vulnerable. You know, is this, uh, the, uh, it's rather hard to distinguish. This is not being a form of slavery, in fact. Uh, and they were, of course, very vulnerable and manipulable and readily available as strike makers. <clears throat> and some companies had a regular pro uh, policy. Every third or fourth year or so, we'll go or get recruit a bunch of new European workers and we'll come back and we can control them and we'll stop this talk about uh, about unions <coughs> and higher wages and uh, that sort of thing. Republicans are the original cheap labor party. And, and it uh, surprised me that some people actually thought that Republicans would oppose uh, President Obama's illegal alien amnesty. Why should they? They never have. Never have before. Uh, we I might also mention that under the Lincoln administration <clears throat> and the succeeding administrations, <clears throat> the government gave away vast amounts of the public lands to, ra to railroads and other corporations. This could have been used for government revenue, support the government without other taxes, but they uh, give it away, immense amounts. And in all this process, it never occurred to them, or rather, they, it occurred to them, and they did, they, uh, did not uh, ever entertain the idea. Why don't we give some land, uh, all this vacant land out west, and here are all these uh, African Americans recently freed who are ready farmers, why don't we give them some of this land? <laughs> The black people are supposed to stay in the South, vote for carpetbaggers, and not darken the northern home front and dis disturb the operations of uh, free white men. Uh, and it's no accident that the Lincoln and Grant administrations are the most corrupt in American history. Uh, Members of Grant's family, his cabinet, his personal staff, his relatives were caught up in uh, uh, vast uh, scandals of corruption. <coughs> and, you know, uh, James Garfield and James G. Blaine were both uh, Republican leaders who were, uh, who were caught up in big, scandal, uh, big scandals, financial scandals. And that didn't permit the uh, Republicans from nominating, from nominating them for president, president one after the other. Garfield <laughs> and uh, Blaine. Uh, another, well, really don't have to um, have time to really go into the, uh, the bank and the uh, debt question, and Dr. Livingston covered that to some extent. But Thomas Jefferson said, mm, 
The earth belongs to the living. The present generation may enjoy the fruits of the earth, but it cannot destroy the equal right of the next generation to the same enjoyment of the fruits of the earth. Some people said, oh, Jefferson's a radical. He doesn't understand the continuity of generations and handing down your property and, uh, to your loved ones. And, uh, st stability in society and so forth. Well, this is nonsense. What Jefferson is talking about is debt. It is deeply immoral for a present generation to enjoy uh, the fruits of the earth and use them up so that they leave uh, the next generation with a vast amount of debt. Uh, as John Taylor puts it, the present age is cajoled to tax and enslave itself by the error of believing that it taxes and enslaves future ages to enrich itself. Uh, and uh, Hamilton's uh, program in general, he says, um, that um, the people have been taught to worship a, a crocodile. And the priest of the crocodile, by which he means Hamilton and these fellows, uh, have taught the people to, to worship a crocodile and to allow themselves to be eaten by the crocodile. This whole business of this federal government that's taking care of the economy. Um, and as Dr. Livingston described, uh, there was an actual Jefferson attempt to do away with debt, not to burden uh, the future generations, uh, but Lincoln's war created a tremendous debt, and it has grown ever since. <laughs> it might be interesting to consider why the government normally would need to borrow money. The government has an immense income. Uh, why does it need to borrow money? Uh, it needs to borrow money because it overspends. That's one thing. But even when it doesn't overspend, it borrows money. Uh, and it's uh, very simple because Alexander Hamilton said a public debt is a public blessing. How can a debt be a blessing? Because the, uh, the wealthy will be bondholders of the government. <laughs> they will own government bonds from which they get substantial tax-free, risk-free interest and they will uphold the government. And so the government will, should borrow money from the wealthy. John Taylor oh, says, well, you know, you're just re recreating Europe. We have a chance here in America to have something better, and you're just recreating the uh, British system. Uh, and we all know about today's uh, debt, which can never be paid. Uh, everything you earn and your grandchildren earn and own to immunity cannot possibly pay the national debt. Uh, and uh, the, the holders of government bonds don't mind this at all. <laughs> you know, they're getting, they're getting the pay for it. And uh, a lot of the U.S. debt is now owned by foreign countries. The founding fathers would have uh, be spinning in their graves. They need this. You know, this is a, who would allow this? It's treason, you know. Good for foreign countries, the ability to control our government. Well, um, you know, all of, all of this could be explicated in greater detail, but um, I do want to repeat. I have uh, generalized pretty pretty widely through this, and uh, 
You know, I'm not, fundamentally, I'm not dealing with dollars and cents. I'm dealing with ideals. You know, what kind of society should we have? And our political economy should reflect that ideal of what kind of society uh, we should have. And uh, our, the society we have certainly does reflect the Hamiltonian and the uh, Lincolnian ideal. So, uh, to the extent that most Americans can't imagine anything else. But hopefully they're they are starting to have, to, as Dr. Livingston suggests, hopefully uh, they're starting to understand that, yes, indeed, there, there is another way of looking at things. Oh, uh, okay. They're, they're in this, the lesson. Thank you.